open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians. It's our study book. We're in the third chapter. We broke the cha third chapter into three sections, 1 through 5, 6 through 10, 11 through 13. In the first two chapters, Paul has uh, told us about the Thessalonians, that he, the Thessalonian believers, he was really concerned about them because he didn't feel he had a, a proper uh, length of time to train them uh, in the Christian walk, in their salvation, the Christian walk, the milk and the meat issues uh, before he had to leave them. And he, under persecution, was forced out uh, he and his, and his missionary team. Now, he had a team, and they're identified in the first chapter, verse 1, uh, that his team uh, that they were familiar were, with, of course, Paul, the lead guy on the team, and then Silas, and then Timothy. And he has wound up in Athens, and he has sent his team out in other directions because we're told he's alone. And so he has sent uh, Silas on a mission. Some we don't know where at this point, but he has sent him on a mission uh, of converts to strengthen and encourage them. And he sent Timothy back to, Thessal to Thessalonica. Uh, and he wants a report. And so in chapter 3, when we get to chapter 3, uh, we we learn in the first five verses as well as today that he sent Timothy back to get a report on, on casualties in the angelic conflict on the spiritual warfare. He was really concerned with them uh, because he knew as soon as he left, Satan, as he does, the coward that he is, he always attacks. He always attacks the vulnerable, the innocent, the, the, the babies, we know he kills babies because we've, we've read Matthew 2. I mean, he's no respecter of persons, that's for sure. So he sent Timothy back in to, to teach them and to give a casualty report. And so Timothy, when, and that's verses 1 through 5, when we get to 6 through 10, Timothy has returned to Paul. Here we are in verse 6. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, all the missionary team is back with him now, and has brought us a good has brought us a good report or good news of your faith and love, and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, that means that their Paul is addressing them as a fa family of God. Through Christ, for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were com comforted about you through your faith. And now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account? As we night and day keep praying most earnestly that we may see your face and may complete doctrinally what is lacking in your faith. When Tim Timothy comes back, he gives a casualty re report and, a, and a, a spiritual status of the church. And Paul knows there's got to be another trip in, Right? Well, look, look at verse 10. And may complete, I, I want to return to you and complete what is lacking in your faith. So <clears throat> there's more and more to be taught to them out of the, the meat concept. Apparently, he feels really comfortable on the milk side of their, their stability and their salvation uh, and in some of the basic concepts of the Christian life. But there's much more that Paul feels they need to know to take them into a spiritual maturity stability. And so that's where, that's where Paul is, is, is in our, our lesson text today. 
uh, I want to address some of those who are attending with us in our church service on, our, on the Internet before I have a prayer and do my study. Um, if, if you're within a 40-mile radius of Birmingham, we invite you to come here and be with us on our teaching days. Right now it's, it's Sunday, and we will be back on Sunday services, two services um, uh, on the Easter Sunday. We began back full swing on that. Uh, if you're out there and you, do, you can't find a church, a, a, a teaching church, it, well, we, we share. Go to our website, doctoralstudies.com, and, and begin to study with us and, uh, and stay in touch with us. There, we may be able to direct you, uh, John Dyer uh, and our team could maybe direct you on our internet to studies that, that would be beneficial in your spiritual growth because there's a lot of information up there. There's hours and hours and hours of Bible study on our website. But sometimes it's difficult to maneuver your way through it uh, to pick out uh, what is probably necessary for your spiritual growth. So we would encourage you to contact us and maybe we can help you walk you, walk you around in our website and maybe you could help us understand uh, some more simplicity of it. So we invite you. Uh, to, and we have, we're engaged in a lot of ministries. We have, uh, we have four overseas ministries with, with boots on the field, missionaries. Uh, we, have a, we have a camp coming up this summer, a, a youth camp. It's, it's chill, uh, youth, by, by youth I mean 9 through 13. We use our teenagers in, uh, in training and all that for camp. They're, they're, the ladies organization here, LLL, they're about, uh, the ladies of the Lord here in the church are about to have a conference uh, the last weekend of March and the 1st of April. No. There you go. It's like horseshoes. If I, if I get close, I'm happy. Uh, the last uh, of April and 1st of May, that weekend. And uh, it's on the website, I suppose. And you can click in and find out about that. And we invite you to, to, to attend that or uh, maybe we could even Zoom them or something. I don't know. If we had enough people, I don't know. I'm using terms I'm not really familiar with. I just, I, I'm a little bit familiar with them. But, um, but anyhow, we're interested in you. I, that's my point. We're interested in you, and, and we want to teach you. That's, that's our purpose. We want to teach you. And any way that we can do this, so contact us uh, through our website. John Dyer is the head of that, and he'll, he'll connect you with the right stuff. Um, well, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, listen, one more, now, one more announcement so I don't have to do this anymore. There, remember, there's a box back there, and what we would like you to do is we're in the May, we're going we're gonna to get back into a full operation on our Sunday, and our, well, we'll be back in full operation in April on Sunday, but we're looking for Wednesday study. We've never missed our Saturdays. We're, we're, we're full speed in that, but Wednesday, we'll, we would like to know if you would like to meet Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, one of those days, would you like to meet for noon or six, six o'clock meal? Noon or six. If you just write that down, circle it. Uh, you know, and I, I can't set, you know, everybody will want a different day, but someday I'll pick the day, all right? I could probably do that now, but I want to make you feel like you're part of it. No, I don't know. Uh, I, I really would. It don't matter what day we do, but... Uh, and, and listen, I'd like to have your reason. Uh, some have answered, have, have put down what they wanted and told me why. And that really helps me. Um, and it may be that I need to do a couple because we have seniors that would like to do it in the daytime and we have other people that are, are working, going to school and all the things we like in the evening. We can do them. Got nothing else to do. Well, I have other things to do, but this is my priority. And, and listen, we got Ernie and we got Al and we've got a lot of people in here who can teach. It's like I have. 
Well, let's have prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. How do we get out of carnality? Back to spirituality. 1 John 1, 9 says something interesting. It says, if we confess our sins, we as believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word cleanse in verse 9 is, is, is identified in verse 7 of 1 John 1 as the blood of Christ. It's, he says the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. So when we get to verse 9, we know how it works. So when you make confession of sin, it takes you back to the cross of Jesus Christ, not as an unbeliever, but as a believer. And when you make your confession of sin, the blood of Christ that brought you into the kingdom establishes you spiritually. When you confess your sin at identifying your need of the blood of Christ to cleanse you from sin, it's for sanctification, not justification. When you come to the cross for salvation, it's justification. When you come to the cross for confession of sin, it's for sanctification, it's to be set apart unto the work of the Holy Spirit of God, the spirit that dwells inside you. It's where the great ministry of the church age under the new covenant is. So that's why you confess your sins for cleansing. And that restores you to spirituality. It brings you back to sanctification, not salvation. Well, how about taking a moment and do that? You do it in silence and privacy where you sit. Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God. Jesus said when he comes, he will be the comforter, the helper, and the spirit of truth. Jesus said, when you know the truth, it will set you free in John 8, 32. And, Father, that's certainly what we need. We need to be set loose from the bondages of worldly thinking, that which distracts us from our walk with God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, well we've looked at our text, so let, let me identify. Uh, I wrote, I wrote in, the, in my introduction to you something that you and I ought to, as doctrinal people, ought to take really serious. I don't know if you've kept up with the doctrinal churches in America, those churches that are really solid in the Word of God. They understand, the pastors understand milk doctrines on salvation, meat doctrines on the Christian way of life, and they teach categorical doctrine in these two categories of, of, of Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. And... I have kept up with that. And I'll tell you, over the last 20 years, they are just about gone. We were all over the South. We had four in, in Alabama. We had five in Mississippi. We were all over the place. <clears throat> Well, now, today, we have one in Huntsville. We have one in Birmingham. We had them all over Georgia. We had them all over the panhandle of Florida. There's now a, still a couple in Georgia and a couple in the panhandle. They are disappearing. I mean, every year they're disappearing. And I'm going to tell you, a church that, with a pastor that doesn't teach milk and meat doctrine is a church that won't survive. They can go religion and they can go law, which most of them have. To survive, they go, they play the devil's game. They, they go legalism. They go law. They don't go grace. Let me tell you what separates the churches of Jesus Christ is grace. 
It's pure and simple. It's either law or grace. There's no in between this group. It's law or, it's law or grace. And the grace churches are slowly going out. And the law churches are growing. And I, I say that to you, and, and this is what Paul is concerned about as part of the angelic conflict. Listen, you've got, we've got bigger troubles in America right now. We've got bigger troubles than what's at Washington. God's controlling all that stuff. Whatever's rolling down out of Washington is out of a divine institution. But listen, what, what makes this whole world click is the church of Jesus Christ. This is the church age. This is what Jesus died on the cross for, to redeem. The, the redeemed are the church. And they have to operate under the ministry of the Holy Spirit and God's grace. We're in a, we're in a real war, I'm telling you. And we as a doctrinal church has, has to really be on top of our game. I think we are, but we need to really be on top of our game. Okay, so I want to talk about five things today. Paul, Paul if you'll know, remember as we look through these verses, he said he, he was concerned about their faith, and their faith brought him uh, comfort and joy. Remember that? Brought him comfort and joy. When he heard that they were standing, uh, standing firm in the Lord by faith, it brought him great joy and comfort because he knows that's how you win in the angelic conflict. Well, 1 Timothy 6, 12, you know, fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Of course it is. So I want to take a look at what Paul has laid out for us as a teaching church ourselves. You see, Paul would have loved the concept of what, what, what we have instituted here. Strong in milk and strong in meat doctrines. You're not going to grow without it. Listen to me, you're not going to grow. The whole purpose of getting saved is get from a baby to an immature to a mature believer. Can't do it any other way. You cannot do it any. First, first Peter 2, 2, newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word regarding salvation. And a believer, listen, a believer knows when he goes to church and leaves, leaves that church hungry that he hasn't fed, been fed, hasn't, hasn't been fed meat. So here we are. Here we are. Point number one. Paul sent Timothy back to, his, to the new converts of Thessalonica to report on their survival of Satan's attack. That's the angelic conflict in, in doctrine. Let me tell you, you always worry about that. On your, on your field. You always worry about that. You always worry about it. You're always concerned about how are the people doing in their lives in regard to the angelic conflict. What kind of casualties do you have? Casualties. How, how many do you have? How, how are they going? And Paul is concerned because he, he told us that when he left, he had to leave hurriedly. He hadn't completed what he felt enough milk doctrines to establish them in their salvation. He was concerned about that. He hopes to get back. So when he said Timothy back, Timothy is back there to, to gird them up. You can't lose your salvation. You know, you can't do this. You can't do that. This, this kind of thing. And, and when Timothy comes back, gives a report and tells them where, they, where Timothy believes they are spiritually, Paul says, I've got to get back there. I'm going to get back with you. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable that you've done really well on what you know. I believe you will hold your ground until I can get back with you and take you to the high ground. Th that was comforting to him to know that. He got a great report of people who were living off a little bit of doctrine but living really strong. And that brought great joy and comfort to him. Paul wanted Timothy to make a thorough inspection of the spiritual casualties of Satan's assault on this young, young group of believers. And so Paul wanted to know 
how battle-weary worn were these people. Uh, because he knew that when he left, Satan would attack. All, all guys know that. We all know that. Paul wanted a, a casualty report. He wanted to know about the spiritually wounded. He wanted to know about those who had deserted. He wanted to know who, who were still fighting, standing on their feet with a sword in their hand of the word of God and fighting the cause of Christ. Because the devil's afraid of those guys. Let me tell you, it don't take a whole army of them either, David. It don't take a whole army of them, David, to kill Goliath. But it takes, it takes a person of faith that believes that God's power is greater than any power on earth. So that's important. And he found that. He got a report. There, there, there is always, when an assault comes, there are always those who are wounded on the field. There are those who desert. A wall, and there are those who still have a sword in their hand, although <clears throat> weary from fighting, they're still fighting. <clears throat> and that was, brought great comfort to him. They still had the spiritual sword, the word of God, in their hand. That, that's at Ephesians 6 17, where it talks about the, you know, put on the full armor of God and that sword. And, and that's true. I mean, you know, it's not a sword you can see, can you? No, it's an invisible sword, isn't it? But it's a mighty sword spiritually. It's a sword that you carry in your soul. And you apply the word of God in appropriate ways. When it says, do that, this is the will of God. You do the will of God, you win. You win in the angelic conflict. Every time you confess your sins and get back, with God's program, you win in the angelic conflict because of the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is what brings the blood of Christ as important in the angelic conflict. Just like when you believe the gospel of Christ, it's the blood of Christ that makes you special and separate in the angelic conflict. Satan can't mess with you anymore without permission. And God is only going to give him enough permission to the degree that you have the ability to, to spiritually fight him and beat him, spiritually fight and win. He never puts anything on you that you can't spiritually fight and win. You should embrace these challenges in your life. They would not come if you were not capable of managing them by faith. It's a faith cycle for us. So Paul wanted a, a, a casual report, and he got it. He wanted to know where they were, were in their faith. Well, some were wounded in it. Okay, we can patch them up. Some have deserted. Let's see if we can find them and see if they'll come back. And, and then there are those who are stand fighting. The group is always a little smaller at different times of its existence because of the battle-worn, weary people. If you stay long enough in that battle, you will, you will see that. And, and we're always recruiting, are we not? We're always recruiting through salvation and people who, who need to spiritually grow and are not being fed. We're always recruiting to build the army of Christ. We're called ambassadors. <laughs> I just called us a recruiter. All right, point number two. It was also Timothy's responsibility to rally the troops. Not emotionally, but doctrinally. His responsibility was to rally the troops by teaching them categorical Bible doctrine pertinent to their salvation, making sure that they were solid in their salvation because Satan, that's always what he attacked. He always attacks the word you got, right? Well, look. If, if you want to know that, go back to the story of Adam and Eve in the garden and watch Satan work Eve. And, Eve, and listen, and Eve works Adam under Satan's rulership. And you'll see that principle. I mean, if you've got the word, you're a threat. If you don't have the word, you're not a threat. You, he's already got you. Gotcha. 
But he attacks the word in you. He attacks the word of God in you. And it doesn't matter who speaks it. If it's a lie, don't buy it. I don't care who, who gives it to you. If it's false, you don't take it. So Timothy's responsibility was to rally the troops by teaching them categorical Bible doctrine, first about salvation and then about the basics of the Christian life. Make sure they know how to walk in the spirit. Make sure they understand the angelic conflict. Put on the full armor of God that you fight and win like, look, look you, know how, you know how simple it is to win in the angelic conflict? It's as simple as not, it's not science. <laughs> That's become a bad word today, science. This fallacy has ruined that word. We don't trust that stuff for anything anymore. We should. If they'd just be transparent and, and give us the ability to think about it, we'd be all right. I don't know, I got carried off on fallacy for a moment. Look at the third chapter, verse 2 in your Bible, 1 Thessalonians. He says, we sent Timothy, notice the word we. He's talking as a Pauline team. Whatever, when you see we, it's identifying chapter 1, verse 1. We sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, watch, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith so that no one would be disturbed by these afflictions, angelic conflict, for you yourself know, they know experientially now. See, Paul taught them. Watch what he taught them, and now they know experientially. For you yourself know experientially now that we have been destined. Now the we has, has in, included them. We, the Pauline team, sent Timothy and, and, you, and you know you're part of our team. You're family now. You're family. For, for now you yourself know that we have been destined for this angelic afflictions in the angelic conflict. Always pay attention to that word affliction. I ta taught you about that. I've already taught you that. 1 Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. Eh? Let me tell you, if you're afraid of dying, you're not, you're not a good fighter. Huh? Because you got to, listen, if, if, you, if you've got a weapon, you have to run into the fire not away from it. You understand? And so you have to have a resolve in your soul that dying is not a bad deal. That it's not the worst thing that could happen to you. It would actually be the best. You understand that? Well, let's read it again because you missed it. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. And you made a great, a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. First Peter 5, 8, and 9 would be prevalent. Watch the word be. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Make sure that someone has not got your name on it. Now watch. What do I do? How do I fight him? Resist him. How? Firm in your faith. Standing firm in your faith in the Lord. How do I resist him? See, that's the key, man. How do I resist him? Listen, I put the word of God on him. He is fearful of the word of God because it judges him. 
to the lake of fire. Resist him, firm in your faith. Where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Knowing, knowing, knowing that the same experience, knowing life experiences, knowing from my own life experiences, the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. See, when I hear that, here's what I think in the world. I think of Morgan, Williams, Molinar, Myers, and a bigger list than that. Missionaries on the home field that I know. Those are the four we support that we have personal connections with. I think about that with Rick and Jackie as they went overseas and had great ministries. I think about that in home missions. Ernie and Lane down at uh, Skyline. Rick and Jackie out in Columbiana. With, with studies, John Dyer and, and uh, Tyler and Ethan and guys like this, Willie out in, in the Moody area of Sinclair County just kicking the doors down for God. This is what I think about. I, I think about how personally, look the word experience, knowing that by the same experiences, that's what I think about. I think about Gary Horton out there can very, very, can't hardly stand and still got the sword in his hand, just fighting like a maniac. I think of Rick Hughes. I think of Joe Griffin. I, 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 my mind just goes nuts with these because they still, there are people who still have the sword in their hand. Per, people that I've had personal experience in warfare. Uh, fighting alongside them. And when I hear past like this, my mind just stops and goes to prayer of people who are actually on the front line fighting for God and winning. They have, they have, they have the hearts of a soldier. They have, a, they, they, they're warriors for God. And that's what, all these guys that engaged in ministry, this is where, this is where it led them. And, and their compassion for others that are in the fight. I think about that all the time. Think about it all the time. 2 Corinthians 11, uh, 2.11 says, In order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, you should circle the word advantage. He's always, a, he's always trying to get one up on. You ever heard that phrase, one up on? Always trying to get one up on you. Always trying to get you to bite the apple. Whatever. Whatever he's teasing you with. I was trying to be kind. In order that, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan... We are not ignorant of his schemes. You know what I find interesting? Say that word scheme. When you go to the passage that talks about the full armor of God, which is Ephesians 6, 10 through 17, in verse 11, he's going to use that same word. Stand firm against the schemes of the devil, he's going to tell you. He's going to tell you next, he's going to tell you that the warfare is not against flesh and blood. It's an invisible war that's real. You know, that may, I used to wonder, what is an invisible war? Till I got a cell phone. How does that work? 
Anybody still have a landline? Only if you probably, yeah. If, if, you're, if you don't want to change the number, you got, yeah, I still got a landline because still people still call me because that, I've kept that because I have, you know, 47 years of ministry. So they still got that phone number. That's the only reason I keep it. Landline made sense to me because it runs down the road and comes into the house. But that other one, Oh, my God knows how that thing does. How does that thing go? It's got a, it ain't got a cord unless it runs out of juice, and then you got, you know, but other than that, what's going on with that deal? God is good, isn't he? Provide us with all that. Listen, I got young guys, they come in class in the School of Biblical Theology with a phone. They have no book in the library, so to speak. They got more than I got. I got a whole room. I got a big room in my house full, full of books that I've studied. The church is loaded with them that other men have studied and given to us. They got it all on a cell phone. Plus a lot more than I got. Now, how does that work? It cost me a small fortune. You know, one of the big ones, when I get when I get home insurance, one of my big deals is my books. And they go like, what? A young guy, young guy go like, what? You got what? You still got books? Well, who's gonna insure books? Yeah, I still get them, but they still insure them because I just I go like, what are you telling me? First, you'll say, my house isn't. Why do you have an insurance on your house? You know, it's in, on your cell phone or something. What are you, crazy? My, the books are mine. I, but they don't want to insure them. We can put all that on that little thing and put it on a chain and hang it around your neck. <laughs> this is the darndest thing I ever thought. I didn't ever think I'd ever live long enough to see all this stuff. Point number three. Paul was comforted. I love that word, comfort. Paracletus, when the comforter comes, the Holy Spirit of God. But what I really like about that word, comfort, comfort, paracletus. It involves three people that have the information that you need to have comfort. Three people that have all the information you need to comfort you in any circumstance in your life. Would you like to know those three people? Would you like to have comfort when you're stressed out and rather than take, you know, 24 pills and be a zombie? I mean, what you're after is comfort. Listen, comfort, paracletus. You can find them all in 2 Corinthians Write that down. It's not in your paper. 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, 1 through 7. The word comfort is used 10 times. I know because Ethan counted them the other day for me in class. He has better eyes than I do because he's so young. I said, Ethan, how many times comfort? I know it's used a lot. Ten times, he said, sir. You should read that. Because the three people that will provide you comfort in their own unique way, and all three will do it on any circumstance, on any day, is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. And they always use the word of God to do it. You should read that passage. That passage is dynamite. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. The word comfort is used 10 times. It involves the Godhead. And boy, that is wonderful. And on those days when, when it's bright outside and cloudy inside, read 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7 and list 
the 10 comforts that he gives you. 1 Thessalonians 3, 7 and 8 out of our passage. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and afflictions, distress and affliction, afflictions is what brought on to you, distress is what it can bring to you. Look, and you can handle both. Look, it always starts out distress. It always starts out stress. It goes to distress, right? And then depressed. Always starts out with stress. Goes to distress. You know, that's SOS, isn't it? You know, SOS, distress. There you go. I don't know. For this reason, brethren, in our distress and afflictions, we were comforted. Air is passive indicative. Air is a point in time, divorce from time. In other, every time that you're distressed and afflicted in the angelic conflict, because the angelic conflict is going to bring distress and affliction, you can be comforted. Passive voice, something you receive, not something you produce. The indicative is a mood of reality of your life. We were comforted about you through your faith. Comforted through your faith. For now we really live. Zoya, listen, now, and I want to show you something. Now we really live. Zoya, zo, z, zeo, it's a present active subjunctive. Now let me tell you something about the subjunctive. If you learn this, it's going to help you study the Bible. Contingent. There's a contingency. In a subjective mood, there's a contingency. You always have to ask. So here, here's what you have to, have to ask. For now we really live. On what contingency? If you, watch this, 30... Watch this. That's a third class condition. If you stand firm, watch this. That's a present active indicative. If you stand firm, second person plural. If you stand firm, what's the contingency? Let's say, now I live. Now I, I live. I'm comforted and I'm, I'm lived. I'm not, I'm not distressed and afflicted. I am comforted. Now I live contingent. On them standing firm in their faith. See that? That's a subjunctive mood. And you always want to, when you're studying the Bible and you come up with a subjunctive mood, one of the things you want to see, what's the contingency for that? Because he's always going to tell you. And there's your doctrine, that categorical doctrine that you need. Faith. And when he says stand and firm, he's talking about the faith cycle. What Paul is excited about is they chose to walk by faith and not by sight of 2 Corinthians 5, 7. They didn't take the easy way. They didn't go the, listen, sight is the easy way. You walk by faith. That's the victorious way. 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4 is how you live victorious. Right? Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. We sing that song. Paul was comforted as a spiritual parent in the role of a spiritual parent to these young believers and their spiritual growth. He was like a proud parent who was bragging on them. Remember in the chapter 2, he talked about that? Just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of God. Isn't that the truth? I mean, isn't that what you really care about? And when you see your children make those great good decisions for God, doesn't make you a proud parent in Christ? 
because you see that they're walking in a manner worthy of their salvation. It's just thrilling in your soul. And that's what Paul is experiencing. Now, point four. Note the joy that Timothy Good's report brought to Paul when he learned they were standing firm in the Lord amidst great persecution. He says, For what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God on your account. What were they doing? Standing firm in the Lord. Battle weary? Yeah. Battle worn? Yes. Sword still in their hand? Yes. Horton always says, and I've known him longer than both of us probably would want to admit. I'm going to die with my boots on. That's a military term. My boots on with a sword in my hand. My boots on and a sword in my hand. Whew. That's for sure. Joy, kara, joy, for all the joy with which we rejoice before our God. I like James 1, 2, 3, and 4. He uses the word consider. Consider, that's a, and he puts, it, he puts it as an aorist imperative. That's a strong command. Consider. When you put all the facts together, when you put this and this and that and that, and you stand back and you look at it, that's consider. And he tells you to do that. And then he tells you what to Consider. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So what's he put, what's he's considered? The various trials. He's had this one, he's had that one, he's had this one, he's had that one. He's considered the various trials. Are you with me? That's what he's considered. And what, what has come, what ha, after considering, what is conclusion? What was his going, because considering all the facts... Putting it all together, you come up with a conclusion. That's the word consider. What do you do? You consider it what? All joy. Listen to what he says in verse 3. He uses the word knowing. Ganasco. And he puts it in a present participle. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith, you know these various trials? Took a good look at them, made a consideration about them, and a conclusion. He says, knowing that the testing of your faith by these various trials, who's doing the testing? God. What's he testing? Faith. That the testing of your faith, which is the word of God, experientially used. See the word knowing? That's exp experiential knowledge. Going through that, going through these experiences of being tested. What's being tested? Not you. What, you, what, what in you? What's being tested in you? It's not you. It's what's in you. What's in you? Faith. What, where's faith come from? Word of God. That's angelic conflict, baby. There it is. I get joy because I know what it produces. I get joy because I know what it produces. Are you with me? I'm just reading the I'm just reading this verse. I'm just trying to explain it. It produces what? Endurance or patience? See, in the, in the English concept, if you say endurance, it, patience is what, what is needed to have endurance. He used endurance because of the word knowing, experiential knowledge. 
And then in, in the next verse, verse 4, I mean, still James 1 on your paper. He says, let endurance, hupomone, translated patience as what it is, but endurance is how it works. Endur patience, endurance. See, that's real time. Patience, real time work in your life. Pa patience working out in your life is enduring. Oh, my goodness. So you won't last a heartbeat if you don't learn that. Wait, the fruit of the Spirit is what? Patience. But what's your responsibility with it? Endurance. To stay patient and endure. Because God's got it. God's got it. He's, he's using you as, right, to test your faith. My, my, my. You're looking at me like I haven't, like we don't. Come on, come on, people. Let endurance have. Have is echo. It's used as an imperative. Let endurance have its perfect results. That's teleos ergon, perfect work. You know what the perfect work is? In the faith cycle, when you get around, when you go from hearing to believing and you get on the other side, that says applying and completing. That's what he's talking about. A completed results, a completed work. Listen, on the faith cycle, on the bottom of your paper, on the hearing and the believing side is where the promise of God is. On the, on the applying and completing side is where the... Is, is where the performance side of God is. Promises on this side, promises of God, are performances of God. That's what Paul is talking about. Let, let endurance have commanded its perfect wor work or results so that you, circle that, so that you, all of this is for you so that you may be, that's a subjunctive. What did I tell you how to always, there's a key word to put with a subjunctive mood. What did I tell you? Oh, dear hearts, you're flunking. What is the key word? Contingent. If you don't write that down. The, the subjunctive mood is used a lot in the Bible. It's experiential. So that you may be subjunctive, contingent, so that you may be, there's a contingency there, we'll come back. Perfect, that's complete. The teleos is maturity. And the other word here, the other word means that there's there's no very, well, I, I wrote it out for you. It means to be whole. Maybe your Bible would translate that whole. It means to be sound in every part. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, you are made body, soul, and spirit. And this word here, where you see H-O-L-O, -O, that's whole, that's, that's W-H-O-L-E, uh, Kleros. And it means that you are, that you are, that you are a one unit. Your body, soul, and spirit are compatible, and they're in sync. My, my, my. Spiritual mature, because that's what comes out of testing. Spiritual mature. B body, soul, and spirit working as a unit through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And watch, lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. The word lacking, it brings you into a grace sufficiency. Lacking nothing. This is all about God. The only way you can, can lack nothing is grace sufficient. First, as 2 Corinthians 12, 9. Right? And a very strong word for nothing. Now, let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be, right, perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Agreed? So what, 
what is the last half of that contingent on? Right? Subjective is contingent. So what are the last, what are the last three things that you get so that you, we know the three things you get, but what's it contingent on? The first part of that sentence. Let endurance have its perfect work. That's the phase cycle going through completion. Now listen. <laughs> We're teaching church. If you want to grow, that's why God sent you here. This is how you grow. This is how you grow. You let the word of God challenge your life. You look at it categorically and doctrinally. You hear it, you believe it. Then comes the time where you apply it and it's completed. And at the end of that, listen to me, write this down. I just have to think of this. It would be important for you. Write this down on the completion side of your faith cycle. Romans 5, in the testing of the angelic conflict, Romans 5, 3 through 5. You'll know that when you get there. Romans 5, 3 through 5. What do I get out of all this? Well, you get a lot of stuff. Listen, this is where we are as a church. We're in the thick of it. I need every one of you. I need to, when you find people that are positive word of God, you need to bring them here. need to bring them here. You need to be evangelical. We need to be evangelical. We need to bring people into Christ and bring them into the word of God. It's hard to get people who have been churched out of goofiness. We need to be evangelical. Get the newborn babes. Get the newborn babes like Paul did. And then Take the responsibility to teach them. Take the responsibility to them. This is where you need to grow. Listen, you'll leave here with the doggy bag. I gave you more today than you need to digest. You won't go away from here hungry. If you're, if you're, if you're, if you're hungry, you won't go away hungry. You'll go away with a doggy bag. I gave you a lot to think on today. You need to really pay attention to that. And listen, if you miss some of this, you can go back to our website this next week. Go back and you can pick this lesson up and listen to it again. William, how many times do you have to listen to it to really get it? At least 10 times. <laughs> Let's close in a word of prayer and then Rick will send us out. Remember, if you want to uh, leave a gift, you, you do it on the way out. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. What a wonderful Father you are. And if Paul, as a spiritual parent, could feel this deeply about his children, how much more than you, as you really talk about that in Hebrews, the 12th chapter. When you discipline us, you talk about it from a parental standpoint. We need to learn to be open to discipline and correct those things in our life that are so out of whack. What we need to do is be sensitive in our walk with the Spirit that when we're out and he's grieved or quenched, that we're immediately confessing our sin to get back into the power system of our life. I pray that for my, our church here today and for those who are listening to us on the internet. We're thankful, Father, for them to want to grow in the word of God and to defeat Satan on their doorstep of life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.